Hi, it's Dr. Steve from Misericordia University, and welcome to music week number one portion of our course, Integrating the Arts. In this week, let's gain an introduction to teaching with music, and let's consider music for students with special needs. In this video, let's begin by considering the importance of teaching music. Why should we use music in our classroom? Then let's look at what exactly is music? How would you define it and describe it? Then let's consider some practical aspects. Let's look at how to find and use music online. And then finally, let's finish the video by considering using music to teach students with special needs in your classroom. So let's begin this portion of our course, the music section, as well as this portion of the video by starting to consider the importance of teaching music. Now, I'll just introduce that here. Uh, throughout our five weeks in this area, throughout our five videos, we will explore this more and more. In Chapter 4 of State Law in Pennsylvania, PDE mandates instructions in the following area. The arts, including active learning experiences in art, music, dance, and theater. In Pennsylvania's academic standards, PDE asks teachers to provide some experience in the production, performance, and exhibition of the arts, that is dance, music, theater, and visual arts. Now that sounds like, like a really heavy thing to do for teachers, but don't worry, we're going to unpack that and take a look at how we can meet up with that. They'd like us to provide historical and cultural context of works in the arts. They'd like for the students to be able to develop a critical response to works of art and also an aesthetic response to works of art. So when I say art, I mean the arts, because now we're going to start focusing on the musical portion uh, of uh, music within this course. Further, in the Pennsylvania Kindergarten Standards, uh, PDE indicates how important uh, music and the arts are to early childhood learning and that it's important to provide students an opportunity to express their individuality in terms of their own interests, their abilities, and their knowledge. When children view the work of others, they learn to appreciate and respect differences in both culture and also viewpoints. And further, arts and humanities help students become more creative problem solvers and more creative learners. So PDE suggests that teachers support learners by giving them ongoing integrated arts experiences in, in throughout all of their educational experience. The Common Core Standards throughout the United States, which includes the Pennsylvania version, which is known as the Pennsylvania Core, seeks to make sure that students receive content in various areas, including the arts. While the Common Core certainly focuses a lot on literature and math, um, Common Core also recognizes that instruction could be enhanced by connecting works of literature or art or music or film uh, to uh, particular lessons. As we discuss in the art portion of this course, music can also improve students' personal qualities. So in addition to academic improvement, students develop more self-esteem, they have more self-discipline when they're working on one task. And many times in music, we work together with other people. So you can develop a sense of teamwork and also the ability to look at problems 
from different angles, which means that ultimately you can generate more possible solutions because of the creativity that's involved in music and the arts. The Journal of the Society of Arts, a British publication, reminds us that educators dating back to Plato insisted on the teaching of music. Now, when we look at that, it's very significant because when you look at the, like in our institution at Misericordia University, uh, we are a liberal arts university. And that means that we, we teach the traditional liberal arts. And we all know that because you take so many courses in philosophy and in fine arts and so on. When we look at Plato's day, music was one of those arts and it was considered to be of the same uh, or, or very similar um, importance as math and literature and sciences. So uh, when we look back to those folks like in the ancient, uh, uh, ancient Greece, that they really viewed music in a deeper, uh, in a deeper way. And uh, another example is St. Augustine. He wrote six whole volumes on the subject of music. So these people really saw music in a whole different depth and a whole different dimension than what many people do in today's day and age. Today, a lot of times we see music as something that is just entertainment value only. Music is also recognized to enhance students' intellectual capabilities. For example, in a study by the makers of the SAT test, they determined that students who participate in private music study, so those who study an instrument or voice, typically score significantly higher in both verbal and math skills than those who have had no musical training or experience at all. Further, it's been found that the longer that students study music, the more that their SATs uh, their scores increase. Another benefit of music and the arts in general, they can improve an appreciation by students of cultural diversity. Music is history. It's not just uh, a description of some historical artifact, like, for example, a song written out of passion for a particular culture or some aspect of culture, uh, that is the artifact. So it's music and the arts are a way to improve appreciation of diversity. For example, students can learn a song from a different culture. And before adults in, in the world taint the views of the student, against possibly different groups of people, different ethnic groups, people from different areas or countries or different socioeconomic backgrounds and so on. Before that can even happen, students can hear the song, they can enjoy it, get a positive experience, and thus they, they learn to appreciate that diversity. When we consider Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences, we find that music addresses several multiple intelligences, at least the musical, the logical, mathematical, and the body kinesthetic. But depending on how music is experienced by the student, they might also hit some of the additional multiple intelligences. And what this means is, if we use music and the arts when we're teaching, we can actually improve academics. Another really important aspect of learning with music and with all of the arts is that involvement in the arts represents active versus passive learning. So instead of sitting and, and being sedentary in, during the learning experience, in the arts, we tend to be very involved and much more active. 
which promotes more uh, uh, better learning and also a more conducive atmosphere to learning. Why teach music or teach with music? According to the PMEA, which is the Pennsylvania Music Education Association, music is a science because we're looking at acoustics and we're looking at reading music uh, and it's and it's like a chart and a graph and you're seeing frequencies change of sounds and intensities and volumes and so it's very much very scientific music is mathematical it very much is anyone who ever learned anything about music about reading it singing it performing it knows that rhythm is in, in rhythm is involved and there's a very much counting a very much mathematical portion to participating in music. Music is kind of like a language unto itself. So it's a foreign language. It has, uh, it has its own semantics. It has its own syntax, its own uh, vocabulary, so to speak. Music, as we have seen with art as well, does not take place. It's not created in a vacuum apart from time. It normally reflects the environment and the times of its creation. Many times it even reflects the country or the, the particular part of the country or the ethnic group or of, of its origin. So music reflects and actually music is history. Music is also a physical education. Anybody involved in creating and producing music in any way knows that you're using your fingers, your arms, you might be using your lungs, uh, your, your diaphragm, uh, using different muscles, you're using your ears. So it's very much a physical experience. So music, PMEA says, is all of these things. But in addition to that, and maybe most of all, it's art. It's an art form. So music allows a person to deal with all of these foundational things, but it adds that artistic, that aesthetic piece, humanism, feeling, our emotions. And as we consider how to teach with and through music in this course, we're going to be referring a lot to the feelings and the emotions that are produced and experienced during uh, integration of the arts in the classroom. So that is why we teach with and through music. Not because we expect students to go on and study music or major in music, although some may. Not because we expect that all students are going to play music or sing all their life, although most people will in some way be involved with music, at least singing uh, just to relax. It's not just so students can relax, but you can relax through music very much. In fact, we're going to take a look at in our course how you can affect even brain waves, and you can truly affect the way people think and how they feel. So you can relax, but not just for that. And not just so students can have fun, although it can add a great element of fun to the classroom. That's that we teach music not just because of these things, but so that we can enhance us being human. Because being human, we want to be able to recognize beauty. We want students to be more sensitive as people. We want them to be able to draw closer to something even bigger than them, something that's infinite, even beyond this world, which you can experience through music. So that people will have something to cling to. Think about it. How many people, when they're feeling down, will play a certain piece of music because they, they want it to kind of level out their mood or it provides hope to them? So you have that thing to cling to, to give you some hope so you can be back in touch with that hope in your life. You're human. We want you to have more love, more compassion, to feel it more deeply, more gentleness, more good. So in short, we're talking about being human and really experiencing life more. 
So we don't just want our students to ultimately go out and make a good living. We want them to know how to live well and to appreciate life. That's why we teach with and through music. It's all very human. Let me just briefly introduce some of the benefits of music in the classroom. Again, we'll just introduce here. We'll spend the next five weeks uh, exploring these uh, and, and dealing with them in more depth. Through music, you can establish a more positive learning atmosphere uh, and, and an atmosphere in which you can build a sense of anticipation by the learners so they get excited about what they're about to learn. And then they can get energized through the learning activities because we'll boost up the energy in them. Depending how you use music, you could actually change the learner's brainwave state. You can help them focus more so we can change their concentration. We can increase their attention span. We can improve their memory. These are some pretty tall things that we're talking about here. Some things that are very important in the world of academics. We can facilitate a multi-sensory learning experience where students are using more than one channel in their brain to learn, one, more than one mod modality of learning. We can help students release tension and relax a little bit more. We can enhance their imagination. We can provide inspiration. We can motivate them. We can add an element of fun and in addition to all of this, we can also teach content through music as well. Wow, that's a lot of benefit from using something as music, something that is simple, something that is accessible to all people. If you use it well, look at all the good you can do in your classroom. Now let's turn our focus toward defining what is music. Think about these questions for a moment. And in our next in-person class, we'll discuss this at a little more length. What would your life be like without music? Where do you encounter music? What would life be like in those places without music? What is so important about music to people? It's a, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Why do we spend so much money on it? What's so important about music? How would you describe it? How would you define it? Let's attempt the task of defining what music is. When you look at it, music is a language. And it truly is because it's got its own syntax, its own vocabulary. And it is a universal language. So if you, as a performing musician, were to meet up with people from another country and they were also performing musicians, you could sit down and read the same music, the printed music, and your uh, produced music would come out sounding the same. In other words, you can read the language. You can talk the language of music. It's also a means of communication. And... And we communicate through various elements, tone, rhythm, different volume, different range of sounds, tempo, which means the speed of the music, and movement. The interesting thing to me in music is that part of the communication, and it's very effective at doing this, is to communicate feelings. Music has the great capacity to convey internal things, feelings, the way we really feel inside about something. And we, because of that, we can express things like hopes and fears and things that we're angry about, things that we love, things that we hold dear. That can all be communicated and enhanced through music. Now let's consider early childhood learners and music. Music is very natural. Children are acquainted with music from birth, and some people claim even before birth. 
They experience the tone of their mother's voice and other family members. The rhythm of a rocking chair or some of those cool devices where children, infants are rocked back and forth with sounds in the background or music. They're familiar with animal sounds and they also chant nonsensical syllables, which is a form of music. The connection between music and early language is a very important thing to take note of. Researchers suggest that before infants know words, they experiment with vocal sounds. And at that time, they gain an understanding of tones and of the rhythm of the sounds that they hear and that they're attempting to mimic and that they're trying to express. So you can conclude that early language learning is very much related to early music learning. Children learn both skills at the same time, language and music. Again, music is natural. And one more point in this area. Music and movement are also connected together. They both reinforce and they strengthen each other. Think about it. When a child hears music, their natural response is to move in some way. Maybe you move in response to, to hearing music as an adult too. For children, likewise, it's very, very natural. So children who are exposed to creative movement as a way of learning, as a language, if you will, for learning, they become more aware of their own bodies, their own natural resources, and they have a better sense of creativity and how they can physically manipulate and use their own bodies, even as a form of expression. Now, let's turn our focus to locating and utilizing online music resources. So what kind of music files, computerized files, are typically used? So a little tech tip, certainly WAVs, MP3s, but there's another type that you might not be as familiar with, and that is a MIDI file. And many times it's .mid, but MIDI stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface. In other words, it's a way that technology and music can interact together. And MIDI files are not recordings. So when you look at it, a WAV file or an MP3 file, uh, somewhere along the line, someone in some fashion held a microphone or sang or spoke into a microphone. When we look at a MIDI file, there's no microphone involved. It's actually, uh, a MIDI file is actually a text file. I'm going to compare it to a player piano. If you've ever seen a player piano work, or like a little um, jewelry box where you, where you spin the uh, little crank and, and the jewelry box makes music, very similar. Both of these are very similar to a MIDI file. They're not recordings of music. Instead, like the player piano rolls, pieces of paper with holes in them and they teach the instrument how to actually play different songs. And they don't can have a singer with them. There's no words, no lyrics, or anything like that. Because a player piano, the role is just teaching the instrument how to play that particular song. So those are three different types of files that you can use in the classroom. Here's a little technology tip. How can you locate songs online? Well, you can certainly go to iTunes or to any other online music service, but you can also search for files, music files at Google. So let's go do that. Now the technology tip here is, if I'm looking for a song like Wheels on the Bus, put all of those words in quotations, because then that way, that you're much more likely to get the hits, the quality of hits that you want. In other words, we'd like to find all of these words together as one unit. So we're much more likely to find this song. Now, if I know of a particular uh, artist 
who performed this, and I'm looking for that particular artist, if it's a first and a last name. Likewise, I would also put quotations for the first and the last, uh, last name. Now, I'm not sure of anybody who I'm going to do this for, so I'm, I'm just going to illustrate this here. So I'm going to say wheels on the bus, and let's go searching. And immediately we can find all kinds of things. Here's the lyrics, and here's various uh, YouTube and various places. Now, I can also, a tech tip is I can put here, add to this, dot .wav. Now, if I do that, rather than looking for an MP3, which many times we end up paying for, waves are normally offered for free. And you can see I'm finding a lot of different wave files here. And in some cases, MP3s, sometimes as well for free. Now, I can also, instead of doing a wave, I could put .mid if I wanted to find a MIDI file. And again, if we look at MIDI files, they're not going to be recorded through a microphone, so it's just going to be a musical rendition of it. I'll throw you one other tip, and that is, let's say I'm looking for MP3s, but I don't really want to pay for them, I can also add the word free. Now, that's not a guarantee that you're going to find all free things, but the word free will appear on the pages in each of these hits. Another technology tip, let's compare different audio file types. Let's consider MP3s compared to WAVs compared to MIDI files. And let's do that by traveling to two different websites. First, let's travel to the Earthlings Electric Washboard Band. This is a great site created by a band who like to create songs for early childhood. So you can look at their CDs, and you can also listen to a lot of clips of songs. And then, one of my favorite sites is the Early Childhood Song Collection at the NIH.gov site, which is the National Institute of Health. So let's take a look at some different file types when we're looking for audio for our classrooms. First of all, I'm going to uh, navigate to a site called earthlingsmusic.net, and they have some really good songs for early childhood. So as I scroll down on their page, you'll notice that they have uh, just various songs in different categories, including some 19th century, some older songs, historic songs uh, used for early childhood, uh, some songs dealing in, in stories. We've got Earth Day and... Uh, we've got some seasonal songs and a whole bunch of things. I'm going to choose a standard song. I'm going to go down to I've Been Working on the Railroad. Notice they're providing two different formats here. I'm going to click into the MP3 version of I've Been Working on the Railroad. Now notice, it's really nice because this was recorded with a microphone. So you notice that there are various sound effects in there, uh, as well as voices and instruments. Now that was the MP3 version, and most of us are familiar with MP3s. The only bad thing with MP3s is, in many cases, we end up paying for them. On this site, we don't have to. Let me click into the wave version of the same song. Notice that's the same song, and it sounds the same uh, pretty much as the MP3. I say pretty much because technically there is a little difference in terms of the recording quality. The MP3 will be higher recording quality than the WAV file. But for the classroom, you're really not going to notice any difference at all. The WAV file will probably take up less storage space. It'll be just a little bit smaller than the MP3. Uh, so if you can find an MP3 or a WAV file, that's ideal 
and either one will work the same in the classroom. Now I'm going to click into one of my favorite sites uh, for early childhood music, and that is the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, which is kids.niehs.nih.gov. And here they've got all kinds of resources, including a lot of songs. So let's look at the same song again, but this time as a MIDI file. Because we say that a MIDI file is like a player piano role in which the piano learns how to play the song, but it does play the piano. The piano plays live, uh, but it's not a recording. So let's listen to this one for a moment. So you'll notice that we're hearing piano, and we're also hearing some drum effects. Now realize some MIDI files are going to be higher quality, and some are going to be lesser quality, depending on who creates those, those songs. Now in this case, the instrument that we're hearing is the computer, uh, the computer sound card on which I'm recording this video. Now as a professional musician, I can also output that MIDI file to a keyboard or a sound module, a sound module that will cost a whole lot more and be of much better quality than the sound card in the typical PC, and then that song will come out sounding a whole lot different and a much higher quality. So notice, big difference between MP3s and WAV files. These files, the, the MIDIs, are not recorded using a microphone. So you will not hear voice on here because no one sang into a microphone. Uh, the piano is not recorded through a microphone. Instead, uh, it's like the piano roll uh, in, in which the piano learns how to play that particular song. And the piano, in this case, is the sound card on the computer or computerized device where you are uh, playing that MIDI file. So what's positive about using a MIDI file in the classroom? Well, ideally, a teacher could use both of the, either WAV or MP3 and a MIDI file. You would use the MIDI, sorry, the uh, MP3 or WAV in order to help teach the words to the song and hear how it's actually performed. Once the children know the song, then we can we can cut out the words and we could just give them accompaniment. And for that, it's ideal to use a MIDI file. When you are searching for music for the early childhood classroom, also don't forget about video. Even if in your classroom you cannot or you choose not to show video, you can still play the video and just hear the audio portion. All kinds of early childhood songs are available and also some pretty interesting videos as well to really interest and stimulate the children. So don't forget about YouTube and other video sources when you're looking for music. A couple of quick technology tips when you're working with videos, especially on YouTube. Think about launching the video before you start class. What this allows is for you to first of all start it and then press the pause button but allow it to, to load in all the way, that will allow you to load the video so that there are no buffering delays. And you're familiar with those. There's nothing worse than you're playing something and all of a sudden it stops and it's got to load in the rest of the way. Another thought, a lot of services have an ad in the beginning or a series of ads. Get the ad over with and be ready just to play the actual video when you're, when you're showing this in class. Also, be sure to set the video to play in the full screen mode. This will avoid other distractors that are going to be happening on the screen. And sometimes some of those distracting elements are ads, and sometimes they're um, like a preview of other videos that are available, and sometimes some of those are inappropriate for the students to see. In addition, by pulling it up to the full screen, you allow students to see the video bigger and 
better and again without distractions. One more quick tech tip. When you're searching a video site such as YouTube, consider not searching at the site itself, but rather searching on Google. And on Google, you can use the site tool, and the site tool will allow you to have more control over the search and find the results that you really want to find. So let's take a look at how we can use these tech tips and prepare a video for use with class. So here I am at Google, but I really want to search YouTube. So I'm going to type the name of the song. Say I'm looking for Wheels on the Bus. Notice I'm putting that in quotes. I'm going to then use the word site colon and put no space and then put the name of the site without the W's. So site colon, no space, YouTube.com. When I do this, now I will find that I am searching at YouTube and now I can have more control over the videos that I'm, the hits that I'm going to receive. And of course I could put another word in, in front of the word site if there was a particular artist that I was looking for. In this case I don't have a particular artist. So I'm going to click on one of these and in the classroom here comes the ad. I'm, I'm now going to, a little loud there, uh, I'm going to uh, run the ad, I'm going to pause, and then I can allow this video to start reading in uh, when I'm in the classroom, because um, many times, unfortunately, uh, the, uh, the bandwidth that we receive in a, a school, in a K-12 environment, may not be the fastest. Now, the other thing we said was, we could click into the full screen. Notice all these distractors over here. Now right now, these are not, uh, they're still distractors, but there's nothing inappropriate here. But you know that sometimes inappropriate material will appear over here too. And in this case, there's something about some, some vehicle ad. It's not inappropriate, but it really doesn't fit here, and it serves as a distractor. So I'll move up into the full screen, and now I'm ready to play and now the students can really enjoy the video with fewer distractions. As our final topic in this video, let's turn our attention toward using music with students with special needs in the classroom. Music is a unique tool for use with students with special needs in the classroom. Music is a successful inclusion tool because it's able to engage special learners and typical students together in an environment that is meaningful to everyone in that classroom. Much research is performed in the area of using music with students with special needs. Research suggests that students with specific diagnosis may have a, a, a higher, higher preference for and also heightened responses to music compared to uh, typically their developing peers. Music has been found to be an effective motivator for many students, either with special needs or typical learners. In general, it tends to help decrease non-compliant behaviors in the classroom, and it helps students increase their attention span and their duration of time spent on task when participating in activities in the classroom. Music can function as a mnemonic aid. Music cueing can be a way to help students with cognitive or language delays. Music can benefit all students in a number of ways. Music can be an effective stimulus to enhance communication. Music can evoke all kinds of emotional responses and potentially to a greater extent than to any other stimuli that you can provide in the classroom. So it can evoke emotional response, which is very important to memory and learning. Music can help a student in terms of focusing and to increase concentration. And music can energize 
or relax a student. And finally, music can improve a child's memory. Let's focus for a moment on students on the spectrum. Music influences the core components typically found in autism. The students' ability to focus, their uh, interactions socially, their verbal and nonverbal interactions, sensory functions, motor skills, behavioral issues. Further, children with autism tend to enjoy music and potentially they even experience it more strongly when you compare them to students without autism. So they prefer music. And children with autism often find it easier to control social situations when music making is involved as an activity than in situations without those types of musical activities. Further, many researchers have indicated that children with autism enjoy music making and learning about music. Listening to music has been found to be very positive uh, for children with autism because it helps them regulate their emotions and to the point that disruptive behavioral patterns have been found to decrease as they're and after they're, they are listening to musical interactive stories. Given all these benefits, music can really be a powerful tool to improve the experience for all students. Music can provide strong metaphors and positive content while they're evoking the emotions and the emotional response from students. So you can help them understand and accept diversity and differences. And further, music can help to create a powerful lesson depending how the teacher incorporates music, good teaching, and powerful metaphors. Teaching with music can make learning and understanding of the, of the content being taught at a, a much deeper level because it, again, will involve uh, the emotions and evoke emotional responses. And educational researchers know that emotions have a, a big uh, role to play in terms of uh, memory and understanding content. When planning musical activities for students with special needs in your classes, consider incorporating these three techniques, chanting, use of images, and movement. In terms of chanting, if students are chanting a rhyme, uh, they will not only create an interest in learning, but it helps them improve memory and also long-term retention of memory, which also means help with recall. And you can do this without having to also teach other elements of a song. Use of images. If you use images, graphics, visuals, and do that when learning a song or listening to some selection of music, this will create strong sensory experiences for students and again enhance understanding and memory. And finally, the third technique of incorporating in movement into a musical activity, you'll also improve motor skills and relax muscle tension for students. At our next in-person class, we're going to take a look at and actually try a number of examples for each of these techniques. As a quick review, in this video we considered the importance of teaching music, then we defined and described music and its elements. Then we considered how to find and use online music, and then we concluded by considering music with students with special needs. In our next in-person class, we're going to highlight some of the research and some of the main points that we considered already in this video, and then we're going to put them into practice with a lot of practical hands-on exercises. In addition, I'm going to show you how to teach a song to your class. I look forward to seeing you at our next class.